Hi, I'm Dr. David Dobson. Welcome to Conversations. Today, my guest is Dr. Annie Wilson. Annie is a senior lecturer of marketing at the Wharton School of, of the University of Pennsylvania. She received her PhD in marketing from Harvard Business School and has an MBA in English and psychology from Georgetown University. Her research interests include minimalism, signaling in consumer behavior, and response to resource scarcity. She has been published in several leading marketing journals and in Harvard Business Review. It's a great pleasure to have you with me today, Annie. Thanks for having me. Your research interests include consumer minimalism. Can you please explain what minimalism is? Yeah, so consumer minimalism, um, I think, could be thought of as kind of a subtopic within minimalism. So minimalism, obviously, we see it in art and music and design and architecture and lots of different places. Um, in the consumer space, I define consumer minimalism as basically a value that orients people toward preferring to have less, uh, whether it's less stuff or more simplicity in design um, or kind of think being more thoughtful about the consumption process. Why are you interested in this particular area? Yeah, so I'm interested in this area uh, mostly because I'm just interested in general of when consumers go to extremes in consumption. Um, so growing up, I was always really fascinated by hoarding. I really love the show Hoarders on A&E or TLC. I think there's multiple versions of it. Um, and I just found it really interesting when people would form these really strong attachments to things. Yeah. Um, so in grad school, I was interested in studying hoarding. Um, and then I thought about, well, what's sort of more marketable, uh, not hoarding, as it turns out. And so at the time, also minimalism was becoming more popular and talked about in popular press. And uh, my colleagues, Mike Norton and Sylvia Beletza, were also thinking about minimalism. So we teamed up and we thought, well, why don't we study why people go to the extreme of having less stuff? And I think in my own life, I've been interested in it just from the perspective of like, when I want more or less. So when I'm kind of in that mood to buy something versus when I look around my house and I'm like, I just want to like get rid of stuff. And so what drives these sort of acquisitive versus disposal states for consumers, I think is really interesting. And I think even situations like the pandemic have made it more interesting of when we want to like nest and have lots of things versus you want to like get rid of everything off your desk to do your work. Why is minimalism important? Yeah, I think minimalism is important because especially in developed economies, we're kind of in these situations where we have an abundance of stuff and it actually causes a lot of stress for people. I think mm -hmm. um, not just from the perspective of there's so many opportunities to buy being pushed at us all the time. So how can we kind of push back against that or resist it? Um, but also a lot of people own a lot of things because mm -hmm. we've been marketed to so aggressively. Yeah. And then stuff is like heavy, not just literally, but also mm -hmm. you become trapped by your stuff and it's yeah. harder to move when you have a lot of stuff. It's hard to be yeah. environmentally friendly when you have a lot of stuff. It's hard to be yeah. financially responsible if you're constantly buying. And so I think minimalism is really important right now from all of the different benefits of like yeah. environmental, financial and personal liberation and mobility. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think it's interesting, like they say, like fish grow to the size of their enclosure. I think humans kind of do the same with their stuff. Like we're like, oh, I have an empty corner. What do I yeah. put in it? And yeah. we're really reluctant to just like leave it empty. But yeah. actually, like having empty space, I think, can feel really freeing when you're comfortable yeah. with that empty space. Yeah. Yeah. My, my more recent work is looking at that question of how minimalism is a status symbol in part because it requires more self-control. Like it's harder to actually not buy stuff, particularly in wealthier areas of the US, than it is to just give in to like every consumption impulse. Yeah. You measure the consumer uh, minimalism construct. You have developed the minimalist consumer scale. Can you share what those scales are and, and what they measure? Yeah, so we have the, the scale to measure minimalism value orientation overall, and then it has three sub dimensions, I think two of which are more obvious than the third. Uh, the first is limited number of possessions, so owning very few things um, and preferring that outcome. So it can't just be you don't have stuff because you don't have the resources to buy things, you actually strive to own less. 
Um, the second is preferring a sparse or simple aesthetic. So you like non-complicated designs or sort of sparse home environments. And then the third is mindfully curated consumption. So this is before you buy something, you think a lot about how it's going to fit in with your other pro items or products or um, how much you really need it. Um, so minimalists don't often have the problem that non-minimalists have of like you buy a jacket and then you get home and you're like, oh, I didn't realize I actually have two of these jackets. Mm -hmm. um, they're usually much more thoughtful and kind of curate their stuff. But that curative mm -hmm. process is also on the disposal side. So they're constantly thinking about what they own and and what they can be getting rid of. Yeah. as well as what they should be acquiring. Yeah. Does this concept have a spiritual significance? So not in the way we've conceptualized it, but I can see that there are religious links. I, I think it would be really interesting to look at correlations with religion, yeah. especially because a lot of religions talk about like a vow of poverty or asceticism yeah. or uh, non-attachment to goods. Yeah. And I think those are all like really important features that probably help you be more minimalist or can make okay. minimalism more attractive. Right. Um, so that would that would be interesting future research, but I haven't looked at any religious dimensions. Okay. Right. And I think that's what's interesting with minimalism is when you can use it to convey status because yeah. it has to be really clear that it's minimalism versus yeah. like if I walk in your home and there's nothing in it, like yeah. I have to know that that's on purpose. But if yeah. I walk in your home, you have this luxurious home and yeah. some rooms yeah. are empty, yeah. then I'm like, wow, this person's really wealthy. Like they yeah. just have empty space. Yeah. So yeah, no, I, I think it's a it's a good question because the frugality or being thrifty could lead yeah. someone to want to be minimalist, but yeah. also you have very high luxury minimalists. Like, yeah. you know, the person who doesn't own anything, but they have a $500 espresso machine or they have really yeah. expensive art. Right. Um, that minimalism can be both like on the luxury and the frugality end and yeah. what it looks. And I think that's what makes it so interesting and hard to define is you have super wealthy minimalists and you have mm. people who are minimalists in part because they're really cheap or they want to save mm. money. Hmm. Based on your research, what is your advice to practice minimalism? Yeah, I think my advice is to figure out why you want to practice minimalism first. Like, what is that outcome that you're hoping for? Like, is it financial freedom? So like the FIRE movement is really big of saving a lot now, living in a tiny home and retiring early. Mm -hmm. um, is it to be more sustainable or mm -hmm. is it to have less sort of visual noise in your environment so you can focus better? I think once you figure out like why you want to be minimalist, that will help guide you of like which dimensions of minimalism you should be focusing on. Mm -hmm. Or for example, also thinking about like why you own the stuff that you own. So I think there's a misconception that minimalism follows a very strict set of rules and you can only have 30 items. And like, then mm -hmm. you're, if you don't do that, you're not a minimalist, mm -hmm. but actually figuring out like what actually brings value to your life mm -hmm. and being mindful about, okay, what role does this play for me? So for example, mm -hmm. like I have a lot of books behind me, mm -hmm. um, but they serve a role for me, even though I've, mm -hmm. I've read all of them. So I don't need them anymore, mm -hmm. but they remind me of when I read them or ideas yeah. or people who wrote them or yeah. times in my life when I was interested in different topics. So it brings yeah. a lot of value to me when I look at them. You're right. Right. You are also a certified personal trainer. Uh, tell me a little bit about this role, please. Yeah, so I became a personal trainer before I got into marketing. So that was okay. sort of a, my my primary role for a long time. Okay. Um, I went into it, I was a college athlete. And then I so I went to the gym a lot. And basically, most of my friends treated me as their personal trainer. So I thought, well, <laughs> why don't I just professionalize this? I really like I really like being in a gym environment. I love fitness. And I like I like working with people in smaller group settings, like one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Um, so it felt like a really good fit. So I got yeah. my personal training license and it's just been something I've kept doing. Uh, so for example, in COVID, I held a lot of personal training sessions. I still kind of train one or two people sporadically, um, more so just to like keep my athlete identity. And also yeah. um, I think it's fun. So um, yeah, I think it's a good way of balancing out also, you know, if things aren't going well on the academic front, then like it's great to go into like an athletic identity and have that sort of different sense of self. So I focus on conditioning and weight training. So okay. um, typically teach like uh, high intensity interval training or um, boot camps okay. or circuit training okay. um, and also more functional fitness. So I think that yeah. became more important in COVID of like, how can you be yeah. fit when you don't have any equipment? Okay. Um, and thinking about like, how can I be fit so that like, I don't, 
tear my shoulder putting a suitcase in an overhead bin like right. how can you actually not just be aesthetically gym fit but yeah. like usefully fit in the world yeah how do you find work life balance yeah so i think i have a lot of work life balance um but i do think i'm very disciplined about it um and i say disciplined rather than motivated because i think it's really easy to lose balance when like work has demands on you or you're really interested in something leisure. Um, and so I usually like make a schedule every night before I go to bed and I write out when I'm going to do things. And for example, I know I want to go to the gym. I know I want to read every day. And so like I carve out that time and put it into my calendar of like, that's when I'm going to do it um, rather than just assuming oh, I'll get to it if I have time. Um, and I think that helps me keep a lot of work-life balance. And then also, I have a really good partner who helps me, uh, makes it possible for me to have hobbies outside of work. Um, and so I think that those are sort of the best ways that I achieve balance. But sometimes I do it despite not wanting it. So this morning I woke up and I didn't really feel like reading like a fiction book because I was like, I have a lot of work to do. Um, but I was like, no, I always feel better when I do it. So I'm just going to do it, even though my impulse is to work more. Yeah. I tend to think that uh, in general, like work expands to the amount of time we allow it. So if I give myself shorter time to work, I'll actually get it done then. If I give myself less time to clean the house, I'll move faster. Um, and I typically think um, the more you take care of yourself, the better you are as a parent and a coworker and a teacher and whatever you do, um, that I actually think it's it's less it's selfless to have that time for yourself so that you can be really present when you're doing those other things. Thank you for your time, Annie. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. You too.